This is the Build Zone Podcast. One, two, three, four. Welcome to episode 132 of the Build Zone Podcast. My name is Allison Jackson. Over there, we have Mike Maloney in the salmon t-shirt. Oh my goodness, what is going on today? Summertime. It's, it's summertime. We have the Rally Agency as our presenting partner, and we have Bald Hill Builders as the lightning round sponsor. Mike, tell us about our sponsors this month. Uh, once again, Eric Horner and the folks at the Rowley Agency, which is a Gallagher company, is still on board to be our presenting sponsor. We appreciate them very much. And they do things uh, like business insurance, charity bonds, personal insurance, employee benefits that have been around for a long time. We are very uh, honored to have them as sponsors, our presenting sponsor. And then this week, we welcome Bald Hill Builders, which is a new sponsor to the uh, podcast for the lightning round. It took me a while to get these uh, guys to get on board, and they are here. And one of the things we'd like to do for our sponsors is kind of go to their website and kind of navigate around. And one of the things that really caught my eyes was uh, they have a diversity kind of a page on there which is fantastic and it's a diversity building a better experience through diversity and it says it's their commitment to diversity equity and inclusion and uh, bald hill builders is a woman business enterprise and bald hill builders understands what it's like to be the underdog having learned our lessons firsthand we are keenly aware of some of the challenges and obstacles faced due to being a wbe woman business enterprise and starting out with a few resources our mission is to con contract with and assist disadvantaged subconscious navigate the challenging business terrain to learn five lessons more quickly with their guidance. And they pride themselves on hiring people from all walks of life, which is pretty awesome. So excited to have uh, Volatile Builders on board next couple of weeks here as the lightning round sponsor. And like we said a minute ago, it is summertime. One of the things I like to do here on the podcast during our intro section is kind of talk about some things going on. And it is summertime, and that means summer blockbusters. And I'm going to see if Allison can name uh, some of the last big blockbusters from the past few summers. So I got a, a biggest summer blockbusters from the past 50 years. Let's see if you can, can you name, can you name, let's see how many that she can name. And for those that are um, young, a blockbuster is a movie oh. that does really well in the theaters, <laughs> right? Or I, I remember it as a VHS store, but oh. that's a, that's what that All means, right. right? Just, just for, for Correct. the younger audience. Correct. The, so blockbuster crowd. movies didn't exist until 1974. So the movie studios come out with a big, the big movie of the year is usually in the summertime. People want to get out of the house. They want to be in an air conditioned building. They want to go someplace cool. And the studios put out a big movie every summer. It's called a blockbuster. It's usually their biggest Bust movie. The one that, yeah. You know, not, not the video store, right? I'm talking about biggest movie of the summer. Do you remember what last year's biggest movie of the summer was? Oh, it was two. It was Barbie and Oppenheimer. Right, so, so the big, so I think according uh, to this list, Barbie was the big one. It does, it does name Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer. Mm -hmm. um, Barbie was actually, it. Barbie was it. I but haven't they, seen it. they, I think Oppenheimer knew Barbie was going to be coming for their throats because they were coming out at the exact same time, and they both wanted to be really, really, really big movies. So they co-marketed, which I think was genius. But I think Barbie still did prevail. All right, so that Allison Jackson, that's one point. Can Thank you go you back to 2022? 2022 it was a big summer movie of 2022. I'm trying to think of when it wasn't an Avengers movie because those were came out like a few years ago, the last one. The biggest blockbuster of 2022. I'll give you a hint. You want a hint? Yeah. Tom Cruise was in it. Oh, was it like the Oceans? No, um, Mission Impossible nope. remake. What was he that's in? A, that's a fantastic guess. That's a great guess, and I was going to say that, but it's a. This is a sequel to an earlier movie. And Tom done, Cruise was in it. Yes, Tom Cruise did a movie in the eighties. It was a big hit in the eighties. They did a sequel in twenty twenty two. I'm. I didn't see it. Top I Gun Maverick. Not. Top Gun Maverick was them. I didn't see it. Oh, I thought I didn't see it. I kind of got cringed because I was just like, oh, I don't, you can't just like remake the old Top Gun. Have, have you seen the old Top Gun? Of course I've seen All the right. old Top Gun. It's so good. All right. Because I know. Why do you think I didn't want to see the new one? I didn't want it to get ruined. We've talked in the past about, you know, some of the movies that you have or haven't seen and yep. you haven't seen. Right. So yep. Top Gun Maverick. All right. Go back to 2021. Can you go see if you can remember that one? I'll give you okay. a hint. It's it's based on an Avenger. It's an Avenger-based movie. Uh, 
Okay. First of all, unfortunately, I know it wasn't the Black Widow movie. Um, that one was not a, a blockbuster, unfortunately. Um, but I do support her. Um, although, was it Wakanda Forever? Before you go any further, Black Panther. Black Widow was a blockbuster in 2021. It had $184 million in ticket sales. So I'm going to give you a point for that one. Oh, I'm, giving you, I'm giving you a point for Black Widow. Yeah, you, point. You, you, you doubted yourself. I'm giving you go a women. Point. Well, because, women. you know, you know these days. 20, 2020. 2020 was a Black Widow was the blockbuster. 21 was the blockbuster. Black Widow, 2021. 2020, what do you got for a guess? I would not have guessed this one. I had. Well, let a, me think, because 2020 was a short year. Yep. Were, were, were they even open? For the summer, everything just closed down. What was coming out then? Oh, give me a hint. It's a it's a movie based on mutants. Uh the boy, the girl that plays Arya Stark. She is the kind of the title. Oh, the X Men remake? No. X Men remake with Jennifer Lawrence? Nope. No, that was nope. old. Arya, the one who plays Arya? Yep. Or Sansa. Arya. And it's based on mutants. It's a mutant, yep. The Teenage so a, Ninja Turtle movie? No. <laughs> I don't know. I uh, don't know what this it's is. It's a movie called The New Mutants. And because it was a pandemic closure year, it only did $24 million in sales, but became the top earning title released in that summer because it was closed. All right, going back to 2019 now. What's the blockbuster? That was a different life, first of all. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, 2019 summer. Ooh, um, it wasn't a horror film, was it? Back to my list here. 2019, no, it was not a horror movie. All right, give me one hint. This is so fun. It's a live action remake of a Disney movie. Mulan. Nope. The Lion King. The I'm Lion King. We're gonna give you oh, a point. We're gonna give you a point of Lion King. That was great. Yeah, Lion King. All right, 2018. 2018. 2018. This, this had uh, to have been Avengers Endgame. It was not. It was not. It, this is a another Pixar movie that's a sequel to a Pixar hit. This what the one that came out in 2018 is the sequel to the Pixar hit. Correct. Okay, so it's not Inside Out because the sequel just came out. Which, if you haven't seen Inside Out, go see it. Go see the second one. Um, oh. sequel to a Pixar. The body, it's a and superhero it's, uh, superhero family. Are the Incredibles? Incredibles two. Yep, Incredibles two. All right, uh, going back to 2017. 2017. We're talking about a superhero. We're talking about. A non Avengers superhero. It's a female. Captain Marvel. No, she's an Avenger, technically. Yeah, she's a Marvel. No, yep, she's where was she when everything was happening? I don't know. Correct. You are correct. That's a good I'm point. I'm still salty good about point. that. I'm still You're, salty. Well, about You're correct. Her. She was out saving other planets, I guess. Whatever. Uh, I mean. All right. Two, um, 2017. Non Avenger superhero. Oh, Deadpool? So it was a female character, oh. non Marvel. Non Marvel female heroine heroine. Come on. Oh, Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman, yeah. Yeah. Right, now, I don't do uh, DC. That's why I don't care about DC. I'm trying to think about if I'm trying to go back to the year you were born. Let's go back to the year. What year you, you born? Guess. Oh shit. Ninety no. Ninety five. Ninety no, three. You were close. All right. All right. So here's it. To wrap it up. A little trivia question. What was the summer blockbuster? Oh, God. Now I'm really old. The year you were born. Summer blockbuster. The year you were born. I feel like my mom has one of those, like, this is what was happening on the week you were born newspaper things that has, like, summer hit. Like, this stuff. So I'm like, I know that's on there. This was but big. Was this was it? a was big. This was a big movie. Lots of CGI. Lots of action. Lots of screaming, lots of big things, big things, sharp teeth. Godzilla. No, close, close. Big things. Big it was based things. on a book by Michael Crichton. Do you know what Michael Crichton is? 
Not a clue. Not a clue. Book by Michael. Uh, it's a. It starts it's off with uh. Dinosaurs. Jurassic correct. Park. Correct. Correct. You are correct. Jurassic yes! Park. Yes. Yep. Jurassic Park. Yes. Uh, I read yes! the book in. I read the book yes! in ninety two. 1993, I went to the Ruben the book? Cinemas. I, mean, I have to tell you, I didn't know there was a book. There's an, the book is way better. Michael Crichton, the author, is As amazing. they usually are. I, I, I waited in line at the Woburn Cinemas for three and a half to almost four hours of waiting in line to go see this movie. This was like the big, it's like the you know, big summer blockbuster, lots yeah. of CGI, so Jurassic Park. Ooh. Right. Uh, the year I was born, 1974, the biggest, that was the first year of the summer blockbuster. 1903. Yep. <laughs> That year, the biggest blockbuster was a movie called The Longest Yard. It was a football movie. That's a great movie. Um, not I've the remake. That. Not the remake. Oh, I've not seen that. Then. The the original's way better. It's got Burt Reynolds leads a football team of prisoners. Right? It's not the Adam Sandler Longest Yard. This is Burt Reynolds. It made forty three million back then. That was considered a you know that number was huge back in the nineteen seventy five. The blockbuster was Jaws. Which I actually I've not seen. Right. Still. Well, that's. That's... But I will say, so my cousin's fiance, it's his favorite movie of all time. He's like met all of the people like that were in the movie. He has like signed merchandise from the movie. He's like obsessed. Yeah. And Crazy. so he was like, please save the first time you watch that yeah. to be with me. And I'm like, great. I will. Um, so that's why I'm holding out. Two summers ago, we set up a projector screen next to my pool and projected Jaws and let the, everyone sit in the pool and watch the movie while I sat in the pool and watched it. It was, it was did fun. you did you go around pretend you were a shark? Did, like swim underneath everybody and nibble on their toes? No, no, no. All right, that's uh, oh. that's our oh. that's that's our movie trivia uh, for the week here. Well, uh, this week on the podcast we have Krista Van Ranst from a company called Building People. We've had uh, the Building People folks in our office a couple times here to do some team building, team bonding. It's been a great experience. It was great talking to Krista. This was a a great interview with her. I've been waiting to talk to her for a couple of months now. I finally got her to. To come on the podcast after uh, much, uh, what do they call it, talking to or uh, sweetening, much know, like to, conversation, persu- schmoozing, schmoozing, trying to schmooze. Yep. So, all right, let's hear it from Krista. <laughs> Listeners, we are in for a treat this week because I've been waiting for this particular podcast interview for a few months now, and I'll, we can tell the story in a minute. But with us today is Krista Van Rant. Uh, she is the founder and learning business partner for a company called Building People. And uh, I'll just read her bio real quick, but she's a transformative leader in the construction industry, renowned for her profound impact. She's the type of leader you want to ride in a battle with. Over a decade of experience, Chris's ex- expertise has yielded remarkable results, including saving a client a staggering $200.4 million through training initiatives and secure over $4 million in vital funds for her clients. Uh, began her journey in 2009 and seen her influence flourish at esteemed companies like Suffolk Construction, TripAdvisor, and Delbrook. Um, welcome to the podcast, Krista. Thank you for having me, Mike. And uh, I, we, we briefly chatted before I hit record here, but uh, Building People has been in our office here doing some team building things with us. It's been great. One of the things we did was um, uh, an exercise. But before we get to that, we'll let Krista introduce yourself and tell us a bit about yourself. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I do want to get to that story, but... Obviously, as you said, Krista Van Ranst, uh, founder of Building People, and excited to to be here and talk with you today about all things people in the construction space. I I think it's great. So uh, she had one of her uh, employees in the office to do some team building with us, and we did this thing called the DISC assessment and kind of get what your personality is. And I knew exactly what I was going to come up as. I'm I'm a D, right? Uh, For those that don't know what DISC, what's the DISC assessment, Krista, for those that that might not know? Yeah, so try not to use it as a personality assessment. Yeah, okay. I think the term personality, but yeah. at the end of the day, that is what most people call it. Uh, it's a behavioral profiling tool. And really what it is getting at is like how you naturally communicate and interact with other people. And and then it, you fill out a lovely questionnaire. There's a lot of science backed behind it. I won't get into that. Uh, and then it shows you your natural style, like how you behave at home with your family and friends and how you adapt to your role. And um, one thing I love, honestly, about this industry, when I was, you you just shared that I, I was mostly in construction in my career prior to starting building people. But when I was at TripAdvisor, people's disc profiles were like off the charts different based on their natural and their adapted profiles. And we won't, I think this is a, this is a lot of information, but yeah. um, what that said to me was that people were, 
burn out quickly because they were basically writing with their opposite hand, right? Like any, I'm left-handed. I could write with my right hand, but at some point it would be exhausting and I probably wouldn't be as good at it. And if I were stressed, you better believe I'm going to go back. I'm going to, you know, like screw it. I'm going and I'm going to write my, with my left hand. Yeah. That is what like disc profiles are. Um, is that like your natural style is like how you naturally communicate and interact with other folks, but you probably every once in a while adapt it for work and who you're interacting with. Um, via email, intentionally over the phone, whatever the case may be. But when you're stressed, the energy to do that is that much more difficult. And these tests are really just helpful as a self-awareness tool. Uh, it, it helps you understand like, oh, this may, this is why I, I do the things that I do. Like, oh, okay, there's now I have some awareness, but also it allows you to adapt your styles now that you have that awareness to like intentionally change them in a certain situation, right? If you're dealing with um, a boss or an owner or a yeah. peer that uh, tends to be really, really fast answering and gives you like three, you know, one one sentence email responses. Yep. You may be able to acknowledge that they are a high D or a high dominance. And yep. so you, rather than sending a four paragraph email back to them, could send them a one sentence back. And maybe there's information below that you're like, I can't help myself, but here's the main piece. And then here's the other information that I, I and, feel and I have to share with you. And, you know, we all did it and we all kind of, we kind of realized what we were, right? And when we separate each other into groups, I had said to uh, one of uh, Chris's employees who was here, Bradford, he's amazing, by the way, that, I, you know, I'm kind of, you know, I know D's, D's can be kind of tough, right? We're fast talkers and, you know, sometimes we're bullies or we're aggressive or whatever, right? But uh, I was like, you know, I'm curious, you know, what did Krista come up as? Oh, she's a, she's a D2. I said, wow, all right, all right. <laughs> I can't wait to talk to Krista on the podcast because I was figuring she was some super squishy, you know, super empathetic, super like, you know, all about the feelings and she's not, she's, she, she is, she is, but she knows, right. She's got to get stuff done. Right. And that's and part of her profile is that she likes to get S done. And I think that's great because Every team needs, if you had a bunch of soft and squishy people who took their time, right, you wouldn't ever hit a deadline. Right? You need someone that's going to grab the bull by the proverbial horns and get it. And I think in this industry, right, like we're building, you're building buildings. So you are able to physically see things getting done right. that if we were only focused on the touchy-feely, we would be missing out on the real results and components that make sense just industry wide, but also business wide, like at the end of the day, people have a lot of different priorities weighing on them, and they have to figure out which one makes the most sense. And if there isn't a clear result as to the value and benefit that this is going to have for an organization, people are probably going to put that on the side burner. And it's funny, the D, even at home, right? So like, I know at home that that drives my D this drives people nuts at home, right? I just even like something as simple as like my competitiveness. Like I know I'm going to, I'm not good at everything, but I, there's things I know I'm good at and I'm going to, doesn't matter. I'm, I'm going to crush you. It doesn't, it doesn't you're going to play baseball, basketball with like a child and be like, you're keeping score in the background. Oh yeah. In your head for yeah, sure. the, yeah. I'm playing with football in the backyard. This is like world series style. You know, I'm, we're, we're, we're into it. Right. And it does, I know, it drives people crazy, but there's other things I'm, I do that probably annoy people because I'm such a D dominant person um so i know that in your experience what are some of the things that you've seen in the market of things changing and i know that company wise and people wise how are things changing that, that you see yeah i think it's you know tends to be known and talked about that there is a lot has changed since covid there it was a boom of hiring and everyone needed to hire every single person and uh, people were making insane amounts I don't think that that is available anymore. One, I think folks have calmed down the hiring process, but either way, there aren't just folks sitting and waiting to be hired at this point anymore. They are, they need to be taught and they need to be trained in house uh, because there's not, there aren't going to be new folks coming at the pace at which construction is continuing to, to occur. So that is one of the things that I think I'm, hearing most about, I think like it's a, a mistakes in the business are expensive and they need to be mitigated, right? Like that one 
doesn't necessarily change. But I think we tend to, in this industry, push all of our mistakes out onto others. And so I am seeing some of the or higher um, leading organizations are focusing on uh, customer experience and building these like really, really intentional relationships with all parties or trade partners, with the owners, with the architects, engineers, like really, really being intentional. And some of the things that they're having to do to, to make those changes are like acknowledge some of the issues that we would, that we've had from the top as, as owners and like always trying to go with the lowest bid but then seeing what the end result is, right? And so that's something that I am I am seeing start to shift and would love to see that continue to shift. Now, um, what are some things that building people does for companies? You know, some company reaches out to you and, you know, take us through that process, I guess, how, how you guys find the companies and how do you get in there and, and help them? Yeah. Um, so construction, everybody says we don't build buildings, we build people. However, many of the trade partners actually are the ones building. But that sentence has been said quite a bit. I'm sure you've heard it at some point said. Uh, however, <laughs> many of the folks in this industry don't actually have a process or plan as to how they go about building those people. And that's where we come into play. And so... Oftentimes we come and help smaller and medium-sized businesses. If you are a 200, 300 person plus company, thousand person company, um, you probably have a full-time learning and development team and HR folks that can help. Uh, but the smaller organizations don't have that. I am a big advocate of smaller organizations having come from larger companies to down to when I was at Delbrook, I was the smallest company I had been at prior to starting building people. And when I started there, it was 120 people. Uh, and I was like, this is amazing. You can, you, your voice can be heard and all, you know, all of, all of those aspects. Um, and so when I just, when I started building people, I specifically wanted to focus on the smaller businesses. I think there's a huge value in uh, what, what, employees can like their career growth and how it can also help them just really shine in life, right? If they can feel the success at work, they can feel success at home as well. Um, but a lot of folks end up leaving those smaller organizations because they don't feel like they have growth opportunities. And right. I thought that, you know, we don't, you don't need a full-time person, but we can help those smaller organizations truly be the backbone of the economy as they as they already are, but making it a place where people actually want to work and stay and grow their careers. So a small business reaches out to you and then how do you guys go in and, and kind of figure out what they need? Yeah. So two different two different um ways that we can work with you one on one. And so we would usually work with you for a year or two and build out all of your people operations. And so we're understanding what are your kind of cultural pain points? What are some of the issues that aren't being talked about or are being talked about, but nothing is done around? What, how are you spending? Um, like wh what major losses do you have? What, like how often are you having to do change orders on a specific area or warranty items? What, looking at some real metrics to say, okay, if we were to reduce those, would that be valuable, right? Because at the end of the day, learning and development and people operations because can one be seen as like just, it's here as a, a necessary evil. It's very tactical in nature, but I want it to be seen as like, no, this is a real value add. They are saving us money and helping us grow as an organization um, so that we can come in and do that one-on-one -on -one, or we have a smaller program that's kind of for, for groups where 10, 20 companies can come at once. We have the next program happening in October and learn all of the processes that we have, build them out in those two days, but then like go out and and roll them out with their organizations on their own. And, and we can help along the line, but not at the level of intimacy as we do with some of our other clients where like we meet with them every week by ourselves one-on-one. -on -one. Right. And then um, for those times you have to, you go to the company and, and, and do your, um, do the classes with the, with the employees. What are some things you guys do with the employees or management, I guess? Yeah. So uh, oftentimes some of, you know, as, as organizations are growing, and as I said before, that, um, you know, there's not just people waiting in the wind to be hired. 
I'm a big proponent that that hiring managers and leaders from outside your organization, if you can, if you cannot do that, if you can grow them and promote them internally, that has huge aspects and effects on your culture. And it will, in, in the sense that people want to stay there, they feel that loyalty, they understand that they have growth opportunities, they aren't going to continue to look at every LinkedIn message that comes their way. Right. right. And so in but they need to understand how to manage. And it is drastically different than being a doer. Right. Like as when you're a doer and you're like you're becoming a super doer and now you're really, really great and really efficient doing the work. And so you're so great at it that they promote you to manager. And now you want all of your folks to do it exactly the same way that you did, because that was what got you there. And then right. you are assuming everyone wants to be there. Amen. Whereas it is drastically different than that. Folks are going to want their own style and, and spice um, right. to add flavor to add to it, uh, but they don't necessarily know how to do it. And often they are going to look at the last manager that they had and just replicate the things that they liked. Right. If there are a lot of great ones, excellent. If there are some not so great ones, they're still going to replicate them because they don't know any different. And so our goal is to build out- yeah, yeah, why not? a program specifically to the construction industry around like management and leadership issues with the understanding of like, we know that not everyone is going to some of the issues and like case studies that other organizations have outside of construction don't necessarily relate here. So we tried to be really intentional on that. Uh, all right. So then when we've in the office, we've been through a couple of Bradford's exercises and they're all great, right? We all kind of you know, I think all of us are like, well, here we go with this one again. But then you do, and you're like, oh, I, and then he equates it, right, to how things work. And it, it's it's great. And I go home and tell my wife these stories. And I've been in, doing this professional, you know, this type of stuff, development stuff for a long time. And yeah. I've used some of those different exercises in, you know, when I was, my previous lives, I was a trainer myself. So I understand, you know, how they, adults learn and how they do that, right? Um for those companies that may be a bit hesitant about bringing you in to maybe improve their people or improve the culture, what is some advice you would give that company who's maybe on the fence about doing something like this? One, we will give you a hundred a, percent a guarantee. If you don't like it for any reason, we will we will buy back the program from you at full price. So there's that aspect of just like really wanting to make sure that you feel confident and good about the program that you uh, participated in. Um, but number two, as, as we were talking about DISC and dominance, yep. um, Bradford and myself and anyone on our team want you to challenge us. Like we we know that people in this industry, the, the term challenge is looked upon affectionately versus frustratingly. Um, obviously maybe, maybe to a certain degree, right? But that like, that we are excited for a challenge. And so in that same regard, I would want you to challenge and say, hey, you know what? I don't necessarily agree with that concept if that were the case. And we feel we feel educated enough that we can have that conversation, but you could also push back and maybe we would say, you're right. And here's another approach that you could take because of the because you just challenged us in this way and we're understanding that it doesn't work for your specific culture here are some other options so we're not just like a parrot company that is just parroting the information back to you every single time we do our best to to really be educated on the information on the industry as a whole as as much as we can without being a project manager or superintendents or the like uh, and and also hearing and listening to the folks in this industry. And we've had lots of guests on talk about company culture. What do you think? Companies have a good company culture. What does that look like? You know, like I said, promoting from within is great, right? But sometimes you you can't promote from within. You've got a job or you've got something that you know uh, you can't fill from within. You have to hire from from outside. What does a good company culture look like to you? Yeah. Um, people raise their hands and they ask questions. They want to understand how, and, and we can uh, speak to this in a moment, but how something like how, how it all interacts because they're, they want to fully understand the big picture. 
right? They're not just asking because they want to nitpick and nitpick and they don't believe that you know what you're talking about. So they're trying to be like, oh, let me let me question them because then I'm going to prove that I'm going to show they don't know what they're doing. They're questioning because they're like, I want to continue to grow in this business. And the more I know and the more questions that I ask, the better suited I'm going to be to be successful down the line here. Uh, so that's one. Yep. The other one that you're not probably going to like uh -oh. is that they they raise their hand and push back when they don't agree. Now there is a there is a way to do that. I don't believe that should be done in a large group setting. That they should that they should call out their the leader um, or or any of the leaders in a group setting. But that could be something that in a smaller in a smaller setting, if you feel comfortable enough with one another that you can ha say, hey, you know what? I disagree. There is a there is a quote. Uh, I re I you know that I love reading. Uh, and there is a book that I recently read called Unreasonable Hospitality. And the gentleman, the author, uh, Will Gadara, his father uh, was talking about his friend and his friend had this saying and the saying that his friend had, I believe his friend's name was Charles Plum. I recently posted about it on LinkedIn. Um, I could be saying his name wrong, but uh, adversity is such a terrible thing to waste. Mm. And I think in this industry, that's really, really relevant and pertinent um, because inevitably there's going to be conflict. Inevitably, like we've set our projects up in the sense that like they can't necessarily just be built the way that they were said that they were going to be built with no adversity right. whatsoever. <laughs> but I think we then get frustrated when that like that's OK to happen on the projects, but it's not OK to happen in the office. And I think we're missing something there. I think it is OK to happen in the office. But you have to have built up some of that relationship that you can you can hear that feedback, you can receive it, but you can also give it. And so it can't just be the leader always being able to like give, you know, um, critiques to their employees. It has to also be the other way around. And when they know that they're not going to be screamed at uh, for just being like, hey, I don't agree with this technology and like here's why the other thing is like not just a not just saying i don't agree with this or i don't like that you my feeling and from a good culture a solid culture has a really they understand that any decision that they are going to make or any feedback they are going to provide has a consequence uh and so they better come with some thoughts or ideas on that and this gentleman I'll, and i'll stop um after this is this, this gentleman dan martell He's a business entrepreneur and he has uh, what he calls the one, three, one model for handling solutions. And he says like, like if you, like you have one problem, you have three possible solutions and then your one planned, uh, like the, the one that you think would be the best fit. And so rather than everyone coming to you to be like, Mike, I don't know how to do this. And what should I do? Like, oh, we have 500 apprentices and I don't know how to like, they don't, can't all fit in the space. What should I do? And you're like, I hired you to figure that out. And so rather than coming to me for it, why don't you think about your one problem? Think about three possible solutions and what your preferred solution is. And then just let me know. And I can, I can help you. I can help confirm that decision for you. I, uh, I like that. And so great. all of those pieces I think are helpful in creating a and I'll speak from, from my own experience. You know, when you raise your hand and say, do you disagree? Someone's usually going to get their feelings hurt. And the D's, right? Don't care about your feelings, right? They got, they got stuff to do, right? Yep. And how do you, what's your piece of advice for those like me who, uh, <laughs> you know, like I said, you, 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 I feel sometimes that because I, I, I don't, I don't want to be like dominant, like a, a bully, but tend to take over. Right. I, I get things done. Right. You know, when someone says I need something done, I'll do it. I take it and do it. You need that moved. I'll, I'll, same thing at home. I'll do it. You know, where some people are like, no. Eh. How, what's some advice you would give, you know, in, in that circumstance when you're, when you're it, at one of these events that you guys do and you have an issue or you have, you disagree with something, you know, I said, you don't want to step on anybody's feelings. I'm not, I'm not intentionally trying to hurt people's feelings, but it just comes across that way. You know, any advice? Yeah. Uh, we're all emotional beings. Uh, and so like some people are going to feel hurt and that will make them like sad and others are going to feel hurt and that is going to make them mad. Uh, and so I think in this industry, there are times where it's like, 
how can I, one, I, I bet that's where I was saying, like, if you are going to disagree with something, maybe explain why mm -hmm. and what you believe would be a possible solution. If you're just there to raise your hand and complain, not like you don't have that. That's not in my mind, part of a like positive culture. And I don't think you necessarily have the right to be able to share that feedback. You don't have to have a fully well scripted explanation right, with right. 10 pages of documents <laughs> behind it, but you right. have to have like, you can't just spit out information and, and disagreement with no, with no explanation as to why. I, so I think there's an aspect that a lot of people like raise their hand and they just like, like, this just doesn't feel right. Like, okay, why? Yep. Yep. Um, and like, if you don't know why now, then like, we're going to continue forward until you can give us some, some more data as to, as to why this is the case. The other thing I think is like, um, I think there's an aspect on both sides. So like, if the other, if, if you are giving feedback to somebody and you can tell that they feel frustrated, um, one, you know, you can, it depends on how you start the conversation. I think if, if you're a manager and you say, Hey, Krista, come into my office, right? Like that, I, I'm going to anticipate that something wasn't good. <laughs> like this is not going to be a great conversation. Whereas if you were like, Krista, you got to come into my office for a second. Oh. I like that quick tone is like, oh, you know what? Like this might be good. And I think if you are going to tell someone something that they don't necessarily is probably not going to be good, you can be intentional about how you are going to um, share that. There's a saying like praise in public and criticize in private, right? Yep. So if that's the case and you know someone's going to get emotional about it, then that is an opportunity to do that behind closed doors or in a smaller one-on-one um, -on -one setting. And also acknowledge like prepping yourself in advance that they're probably going to have some emotions yeah. and maybe in like thinking through how you can communicate it. I'm not saying that you have to mitigate it because I don't think you do, but just acknowledging that like, if you, that, that you didn't think they were going to be happy and you don't necessarily need to be like, trying to make a joke or this like some weird weird flex around right, it right that's the trending term uh one of the one of the questions i want to ask you is you know in your time doing this for companies without naming any names is there one particular company that jumps out at you where maybe there was a an owner or a leadership somewhere was like yeah this is all fluffiness and we can't do this but then you turn them around and you've seen a, a growth or you've seen the culture change do you have any good stories like that um, I, I, there, there is one client who was like, we can't, we can't do any sort of training because, um, our employees are all paid by the projects, right? They're a trade partner. And so we would have to take them off the project and pay for their time to go through training. And I was like, that is, that is correct. <laughs> uh, and so for like, months they were like nope sorry we can't do it like we just were you know and and they said prior to covid we were our our profit margins were great and then covid ruined everything and they were truly like two or three years in this has like been a recent transition that they continually were breaking even and i think eventually their leadership said to the ceo like I get like, I, I think we have to acknowledge that the people aspect that we haven't been focusing on is now getting like is affecting our profit because yes, COVID like has changed things, but we haven't changed a single aspect. We haven't changed with it. And so instead we are, we are failing, we're flailing. Uh, and so they have finally gotten that CEO on board to build out more training and are seeing oh, you know what, <laughs> if I hire this person and I spend $1,500 of their time in that first week, I don't end up spending $2,500 yep. on rework in that first month. I may end up spending 500, which is like, you know, so you're getting there, but like, you're like, it's a, I'm actually saving money. And right. then down the line, they are continuing to do better because of it. And it, it's funny back in my early days being a trainer, right? You know, when cuts had to be made, the first place they went was training. 
cut the trainer, cut that training, get that out of there. And it's because it's not a tangible thing you can put your hands on, right? So yeah. companies will go buy a new bulldozer, a new crane, some new vans, some new tools, right? They'll go hire some super for X number of dollars, but they don't care about the training piece, getting the, like I said, some leadership training. With so many of these people come up nowadays, whether it be right out of college, they have not, they've got no leadership. Some of these students have never, some of these college kids have never worked anywhere. They've gone right to school. They come out of school. They maybe did internship, a little bit of leadership, but the leadership training that they need, you know, they don't have that mentor. They don't have that person that can teach them. So, you know, how important do you think, you know, and you're, and I know what you're going to say, I think, but uh, as opposed to like spending, making sure you've got some money for your training for people, right? Whether it be leadership, but what are some other things you should think that people should get, that employees should get for that? Yeah. So uh, I, I think that companies, if they look at their overall profit at the, uh, um, there's two ways to look at like how much you can, you should ideally be spending. Um, but also then I want to think about the the benefits and the results, right? I think a lot of training uh, departments in many industries, not just construction, do not focus on how they can truly measure and show the value that training provides to the company. And I think that's a mistake. If you think about like recruiting costs, oh. most most organizations probably have many organizations I know have a six figure recruiting budget, um, and they hired two people, right? Like it's uh, you know maybe maybe it's a little bit more than that, but yep. um, it's not a ton, and they just know that that's a necessary evil. Uh, I would say that it is less of a necessary evil, and you could train. 75 of your people right um for a similar like you can provide real opportunities and show value in that you are trying to uh, invest in their like individual growth for a similar price point yep. um it, rather than rather than having to hire externally love it the other right, thing i'll say is that like i think there's an aspect of looking at your either like your profit margins and saying okay i want it to like you know, maybe it's going to be 1% of our, of our like net profit would be for learning and development uh, of our people to continually grow them or like three to 5% of your um, overall salary of your employees. So if right. you have a hundred employees and whatever that number is, like take three to 5% of that and add it to your overall budget. Right, so this is our friend Krista Van Rens from Building People. Krista, if they, anybody has any questions for you or wants to learn more about the business, how can they get a hold of you? Yeah. Uh, so you can email me at K-R-Y-S-T-A. That's Krista spelled with a Y. My mom had to be different. Uh, <laughs> at buildingppl.com. Or you can find me on LinkedIn uh, by searching Krista Van Rens. I'd love to connect with you. So please feel free. Awesome. And you are an ABC Mass member. So welcome as a membership. I know you work with a lot of ABC Mass members and a lot of people that aren't members. So whether you member or not, reach out to Krista. She can definitely, you know, we use the business here. We use her company here in the office. We actually have a training on Thursday. So looking forward to that. All right. Now comes my favorite part of the podcast, the lightning round. This is going to be a good one. Um, the zombie apocalypse is coming. Who are three people you would want on your team? Could be dead or alive. Could be anybody. Three zombie apocalypse is coming. Who would I want on my team? To fight those zombies. To fight those zombies. Well, in college, I had a leadership program that I did, and I wrote an essay on Al Capone because I was like, I don't oh. want just all of the like super positive, you know, like if we're talking about dominance in our disc profiles. So I chose Al Capone. So I'm gonna keep him in my in all my right. list of people that I would like do some cool things with. I I don't think he would let zombies uh nope. attack too many um and then maybe like bear grills i feel like he'd Ooh. be able to help us out figuring uh out some some life aspects and then maybe like a uh, martha stewart or rachel ray someone who could help us like eat some solid food uh in a in a good way what do you think is that a good uh, those are three people no one's ever said that combination <laughs> is crazy al capone bear grills and martha stewart love it love it love it um Let's see. What else can we ask you? Uh, who was your childhood actor or actress crush? Um, uh, Ryan Gosling Ooh. is still still is. <laughs> right. Um, let's see here. If you had your own late night talk show, who would you invite as your first guest? Oh God! Late night talk show. Who would I invite as my first guest? 
I think Mike Fish. He would be plenty entertaining. Mike Fish. CEO of Delbrook Construction. Love it. Uh, if a movie was made of your life, what genre would it be and who would play you? Oh, God. Um, who could play? Oh, that's fun. This is could be fun. anybody, right? Um, how about Scarlett Johansson? Ooh. That would be fun. Right. I don't know why she would play me, but that would be, I would enjoy, I would feel Great. very uh, complimentary if she, uh, if she was. Like, what was the genre? What would the genre be? The, the genre would be around like female, female empowerment because right. my husband is a stay at home dad. And there's just a little aspect of us like twisting the chains on society a little there. Uh, I'm trying myself to be a stay at home dad for my children. Yes. But- my youngest is 16 and my wife says we don't need to stay at home bed. <laughs> so that, well, I've keep tried. trying. It never, I, you know, you don't have to stop. Listen, trying. I keep trying. Every time she gets a raise or a promotion, I'm like, listen, stay at home dad. One step closer. She goes, you are absolutely never going to be a stay. The, kid, the babies are 16. That's the, the youngest. <laughs> they 16, need you so. now more than ever. Oh, man. I don't know. Uh, least favorite food as a child. And do you still hate it now or do you love it? I hated all food as a child. I was probably one of the pickiest eaters and didn't have a deli sandwich until college i would only eat pasta plain with shake parmesan cheese no butter yep. uh and now i eat all thing all things so i don't know that i had like a like one partic- specific food that i hated other than like anything that wasn't carbs wait well wait, was like your mom and dad a good cook or you know or you just didn't like what they were cooking. Or I'm not just... going to answer that because both of them could listen to this podcast. Okay. Oh, and sorry so about that. Be very positive we'll about that. that, up, that <laughs> uh, my tr- children are also pasta eaters. Uh, very Italian. My wife makes Italian sauce and pasta and stuff like that. They themselves are butter pasta with garlic salt, and that's pretty much all. Like, I can think of the fanciest restaurant in the world. We're eating yep. butter pasta. Yep. yep. Uh, the '60s, the '70s, the '80s, the '90s, or the 2000s. What decade do you love the most, and why? Mm, the 90s for their music yeah that's what a lot of people say the 90s music. uh what was on your what was on your mixtape back in the 90s oh god uh um britney spears in sync and backstreet boys probably well, yeah, awesome uh if you had to delete all but three apps from your smartphone which ones would you keep i would keep uh asana i would keep which is a project management like task management tool I would keep my, it's like texting count, or is that not an app? That's an app, sure. Oh, I definitely would keep my my, my texting tool. Uh, and I would probably also keep uh, the Google Drive. I just always need to like access all of my information. Boring well, answer, but. That's all right. Uh, coffee, are you a coffee drinker or a tea drinker? I drink chai tea. Coffee is too much for me. I'm, I Caffeine doesn't do well for me. Uh, your favorite TV show? survivor uh i know you're a book reader so last what book uh have you read recently you would recommend and why honestly i just finished it today well built by this oh. gentleman chad prinkney uh how the top two percent of construction contractors create superior value profits and excellence oh well, that's a perfect time this is amazing yeah uh what fictional family would you be a member of hmm. don't know a ton of fictional families that one's make hard. some make believe family it could be from a TV show or a book you read or a movie or a um a make believe family yeah. that I would be a member of uh I don't know the Brady Bunch that's fine that's a good answer that's a, yeah why not uh and then last but not least we'll ask this question everybody here there's a food fight at your house tonight between you at, at, at your dinner table uh what is your weapon of choice and you cannot say spaghetti. And you cannot say, but it has to yeah. be food. It has to be, well, yeah, food fight. Yep. What are, you, what are you trucking around the dinner table tonight? Ooh, a hot dog. That's it? Just one hot dog? Oh, well, maybe multiple hot dogs. Well, just firing multiple hot dogs? Just, just chucking oh, hot gosh. dogs. I'd like to see that. That'd be funny. Funny picture to see that at the dinner table. Yeah. All right. That's our friend, Krista, from Building People. We appreciate it so much. Your team at Building People has been great. We love having them here in the, in the office. And hopefully uh, some people out there listening will reach out to you and get you in their building. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.